This is Danielle Hayden from Kickstarter County Inc. And you are listening to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. Hey, awesome food bloggers. Before we dig into this episode, I have a really quick favor to ask you. Go to your favorite podcast player, go to Eat Blog Talk, scroll down to the bottom where you see the ratings and review section. Leave Eat Blog Talk a five-star rating if you love this podcast and leave a great review. This will only benefit this podcast. It adds value. And I so very much appreciate your efforts with this. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, now on to the episode. What's up, food bloggers? Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, the podcast for food bloggers looking for the value and confidence that will move the needle forward in your business. This episode is sponsored by Rank IQ. I am your host, Megan Porta. Today, Danielle Hayden and I are going to have a conversation about profitable blogging. Danielle is the host of the Entrepreneur Money Stories podcast, a reformed corporate CFO and co-owner of Kickstart Accounting, Inc. She helps female entrepreneurs increase their profitability and take home pay. She's passionate about helping business owners to not think about accounting as the evil tool needed to file taxes, but the best tool in your tool belt to help you build the business of your dreams. Love that bio, and I'm so excited to have this chat with you today, Danielle, but first, we all want to hear your fun fact. Yeah, fun fact. Gosh, um, life has been so... Um in the weeds of, of like going through the motions lately that I've had to tell myself a lot lately about, um, enjoying, enjoying the discomfort of, of, of the, the journey rather than focusing on the destination of our goals. And so I know we'll talk a little bit about financial goal setting and stuff. Um, so, uh, just speaking of my own, own process of building my own business and raising kids and doing all the things is really just learning how to enjoy the process of getting to our destination and the journey behind that. Oh, I love that. And I feel like this is a common theme right now. I don't know. 2022 seems to have just kind of started with a bang for a lot of people with <laughs> COVID running rampant. And I i mean, we can all learn from that, just going through the motions and taking a moment to just look around, even if it is not comfortable to do that. I think it's really important. So thank you for that reminder. Great way to start. So you're here today to talk about profitable blogging. And um, in a little bit after we kind of talk through your points, you can tell us about Kickstart Accounting. I'm curious to hear about that too. But why don't we start off by just having you talk us through how to define what a blog's financial goals are? Like, how do we get there? I feel like that is such a big thing to digest. So maybe you can just break that down for us a little bit. Yeah. So I believe in in taking kind of the bottom up approach. So this is a little bit different from what you'll hear from a, a lot of gurus out there. I believe that our expenses tell us where our revenue needs to be rather than our revenue dictating where we're going. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear from people all the time, get to six figures or hitting half million or I finally hit my first million. And I want us to to stop focusing so much on what our gross revenue is and put more focus on on what are our expenses, right? So staying profitable. What are our expenses that are needed, including our time, ladies and gentlemen, our time as business owners, as bloggers, it includes our time in order for us to to be able to um, hit those those revenue goals. So, um, you know, I, I will hear you'll hear me say all the time. I want you to know your numbers, and the reason I want you to know your numbers is so that you can do calculations like financial goal setting. And so people say to me all the time, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." What the hell does fi- no know your numbers mean? <laughs> I can hear I can hear you rolling your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but knowing your numbers is the process of of putting all of the information into a system such as QuickBooks or having your bookkeeper or your fin- your money team put that information into QuickBooks and then pulling it back out, right? So it's it's the process of pulling the information back out of the, the system to then take a step back as the CEO and say, what does this mean to me, right? Where am I spending money? And so in order to be able to set financial goals, that means you've entered the, the information into a system, and now you're able to export that back out. And you, from, from doing that exercise, you're able to find what are my average monthly operating expenses? And th- this is, you know, a lot of people say to me, 
I mean, and I'm, I do online work, right? I don't have a lot of expenses, but they're more than you think. Think about all of the active subscriptions and tools that you need in order to be able to perform your job and perform your job well. Uh, think about everything that you need for advertising and marketing and, and emails. Um, think about how you're paying your people. Um, who, who do you need to pay? And then, so I want you to have a really beautiful average of how much money needs to go out the door every month in order to be able to keep your business afloat, right? Just just to continue to say, my doors are still open, right? That's what that amount says. Now, in order to set, you, set your financial goals, we need to add a few more numbers to that. It won't get too nitty gritty here, but what, I, but what we're going to add on top is, what do I need to make on a monthly basis in order to support my personal goals, right? So how much do I need to be able to bring home to support my personal life. Because let's face it, that's why we're all, all in business. Uh, it, so how much do we need from there? And then let's say we have any debt that we need to to, to pay back. Um, then we'll add in our, our debt payments on average, what we need to pay to our, to our, to our debt in order to maintain um, a cash liquidity. Now, that's your financial goal, right? Because business isn't just business siloed from your personal. Your business and your personal have to work together. And so we need to know what the, those goals are together. Now we can set a beautiful monthly financial goal. Oh, you laid that out so well. And you're right. I have never quite heard anyone break it down like that before, but I love that you kind of um, do a little bit of an opposite approach. That's really unique. But I think in the blogging business, I think that will resonate with a lot of people. So I just wrote mad notes and I thought that was brilliant. Um, <laughs> so what are, your, what are your thoughts about like how we evaluate when new things pop up? Because as a food blogger, we're constantly you know, being faced with like, oh, you need to hire a coach or you need to get this course on SEO. And now there's a course on photography and there's so many things that we can invest in. So what is your approach for that? How do we make those decisions smartly? Yeah. So some of what you described is shiny object syndrome. And then some of what you described is the wearing all the hats syndrome. <laughs> and they're both really real in entrepreneurship, right? Uh, I think I read somewhere that we are the most advertised to demographic out there, right? Like if you're going to run an ad to entrepreneurs, it is the most expensive ad that you can run because we're so heavily advertised to. Now, what does that mean for us as entrepreneurs? That means we have to really get good at deciding where we want to spend our time, money, and, and energy. So what courses do we want to buy? What masterminds do we want to, to, to belong to? Um, what, what investments into our business do we, do we need to make? So um, there's, there's that shiny object piece. And then there is, I think I can do everything myself, right? For some reason, also as entrepreneurs, we think we can do everything our, on our own. And so although we want to write a blog, we've now become the CEO, the CFO, right? Financial officer, the chief marketing officer, the head of sales, um, you know, head of, of investor relationships and, you know, <laughs> So many. Right. I'm a manager of all my contractors, of the advertisers, right? I'm I'm a manager of everything. And so why do we think that we need to wear all the hats the minute we become a, an entrepreneur? And so um I I like to um think of everything um uh, in kind of like an energy bucket, right? So is this the one the best use of my time? Right? Is there somebody who can do this better? more efficient um, or more accurate, honestly, right? Because just because we can do it doesn't mean we're doing it well. So those are kind of the three questions to ask yourself every time you decide, should I buy this course and learn how to do this myself? Or should I partner with an expert who can do this better than I can? And I can have this off my plate, right? I can strip off a hat. And then in terms of shiny object syndrome, you could use the same, the same, questions, right? Is that really the best use of your energy and your time? And is it going to help make a process more efficient um, or better your, your, your customer experience or better your backend operations? Um, I, I think that 
as entrepreneurs, we like to make decisions with our heart, with our gut, right? That's like what made us become entrepreneurs in the, in the first place. And so how can we temper that with, is this worth the money, right? Is this like, what is the trade-off between time and money? You brought up something that I know you just posed it in a way that I've really never thought about it before. So I've never considered this. Like if I'm looking at a course, for example, that's maybe a a high ticket course, $2,000, let's say. If I want to invest in that course, maybe I should also consider taking that $2,000 and outsourcing for a year or six months to get the job done itself, you know, from somewhere else. So that's really interesting. Like, do you invest the money or do you invest in someone else doing this job potentially better than I can? So how do we sort through that? How do we figure out where to put our energy and our time? Yeah. So I think there's the, there's, uh, there is a cost analysis to this, right? So how much would it cost me to buy this course plus how much time how much time do i need to spend going through the course and then learning to be an expert right and then multiply that by what your hourly rate is you can find out your hourly rate with by by um, what is the annual rate that you want to be making or the monthly rate that you want to be making? Um, what do you want to take home for, for your family right We talked about that in in the last scenario. So what do we want to be taking home to our family? Or what's average for this industry? I just, I hate using that one. <laughs> you don't have to go by what's average, right? I want you to all be superior to average. So I want yes. you to know, like, what do you need for your family to hit your your life dreams? And then divide that by, let's say you work 40 hours a week. So take your annual rate, divide that by 2,088. Um, that is your rate of pay. So it's the time spent in the course, time becoming an exp- expert. And then because you haven't done this over and over and over again, it's time learning and fumbling and 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 figuring out how to do it the right way. So I want you to calculate all of that time and energy plus the course cost. And this is an Excel spreadsheet document, right? Like I want you to have course costs, sell a one, <laughs> time, time for course, time it's for implementing, right? I want you to have each one of those listed out so you can have a total. And then I want you to find three vendors. This is back from my corporate days. Everything was, you had to at least um, check the cost of three different places, right? You wanted to make sure you were doing your due diligence. So um, I want you to contact three different vendors and come up with the cost of, of each of those vendors. And then multiply that for maybe, let's say, going back to your example for a year. So multiply that by 12. People are surprised, right? I can't tell you how often we do this with clients and like, wow. I should have just hired somebody else to do my SEO. (laughs) Let's take a really quick break, food bloggers, to chat about my new favorite keyword research tool that I am excited to share with you. Rank IQ is a custom keyword library packed with keywords that are easy to rank for and that also have high search volume. We all know that the food blogging space is more saturated than ever before. If we continue trudging along, doing the same things we've always done and doing the same things that everyone else is doing, our wheels will continue to spin. We have to do something that sets us apart from the rest. I believe that using Rank IQ to do your keyword research can be that thing for you. Here are a few of my favorite things about Rank IQ. It saves me so much time writing blog posts. I can get a new post kicked out in two hours or less thanks to the really handy optimizer that's built into the tool. Also, I know exactly how fast something will rank based on the competition score and the time to rank score. I am no longer guessing about how successful a keyword will be before spending hours writing about it and then finding that it actually didn't take off ever. Go to rankiq.com to sign up and see for yourself how powerful this tool is. If you're looking for that thing to separate you from the rest of the food bloggers in this space, Rank IQ could be that thing. Now let's get back to the episode. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when you break it down like that, it seems so smart to go through some of that, um, to think through some of it in, in advance, because like you mentioned, shiny object, that phrase, we get so just swayed with like, you need this, you need to learn SEO. So here's a great course that's going to teach it 
to you, but do I need to learn SEO or can I hire someone else? So this is really great way to just go about thinking through it differently and maybe not doing all of the things and taking some of those hats off so that somebody else can do it more efficiently. Yeah. Are you really going to be an expert in, in that? And are, are you ever going to use it again? Right. Um, I mean, I know I've, I've invested in things over time where I'm like, <laughs> I invested so much time, money and energy. And I'm not the expert. So I ended up hiring somebody else anyway. I recently had somebody say to me, I'm, I'm deciding between um, hiring, hiring your firm for bookkeeping or um, taking this QuickBooks online course. And she ended up taking the QuickBooks online course. And I support that, right? I, I support learning learning how to do it. And she came to us a year later and she's like, hey, I really don't feel like this is making sense. I, I'm not sure that this is accurate. And here, the poor thing overpaid on taxes. All of her sales were duplicated. She didn't have all of her expenses included and she overpaid on taxes and she wasn't set up correctly and she wasn't able to use the numbers. And so, yes, she took the course and yes, she gave it a lot. She gave it so much time and energy and effort for it to not be accurate in the end, right? And there's consequences for it to not be accurate. I, I, I'm, I'm using the example of bookkeeping, but there's there are consequences of things not being being accurate or or done correctly. This is your brand. This is your livelihood. And so, I also want maybe part of this analysis to be: if it goes wrong, what are some of the other consequences of me doing this on my own and not being the expert? There's the question right there. If this goes wrong, what is going what are the implications going to be then? There's so much though. Like there are so many different pieces. How do you recommend um creating those buckets where we want to keep our energy and like how do we know what we want to get rid of? Uh you know, I'm a list builder. <laughs> um I, you know, we um when we set budgets with clients, um we energy check our budgets, right? So it's not just here's the dollar and cents for hiring somebody or investing in a, in a software subscription. There's there's an energy evaluation as well. So if I don't hire this contractor or I don't invest in this product solution, what how much energy is going to be drained on me personally as the business owner? Um, and you can rate that. So um, sometimes with clients, we do red, yellow, green. So some people like to see... The, the the color version of this, um, I'm I'm more you know quantitative, so um, I like to rate it like one through ten. Um, you know, if I want, if I really want to do this activity and it gives me a ton of energy, then I'm going to rate it a ten. If it gives me no energy and I do not want to do it, I know that the task is just going to follow on my to do list. Uh, then I I give it a one, and so you can you can decide where to put your time, energy, and money uh, based on on, on really like evaluating, like look at all the places that you're spending your money now and in the future, color code that or, or give that uh, a rating. And then that's going to give you something real to go by, right? It's not a feeling like, oh, I just don't feel like doing that. Well, is it that I just don't like, I didn't feel like running this morning either. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so is it yeah. like, I, sh- I really genuinely don't feel like it or... um. I don't feel like it, but it's going to give me energy in the long run, right? So so you really have to map that out for yourself and then make decisions. I almost feel like we as food bloggers could just take an Excel spreadsheet and just write out all of the things that we do and do that, like go through and rate each one so that it's like you said, it's not just a feeling. It also has a number to it. Because numbers speak to us, I think, a little bit more like, oh, that is significant. I really don't want to do that. That has a one. And just doing that with everything and maybe um, prioritizing that way as far as where to put our energy and where to take it from. So what do you think about like instead of determining um, where to put our energy on a project basis or like a case by case basis? How do we do that more ongoing, like from now until the end of the year and beyond? Yeah. So I recommend um, that every business owner looks at their metrics on a monthly basis. Uh, um, you know, some people do it more often on a weekly basis. Other people do it on a quarterly basis. I think for me, best practices that we're looking at this on a monthly basis. And so I want you to be pulling your numbers um, 
each month. So make a date with the CEO. Um, and, and by looking at your metrics, so what gets measured gets managed. And so by looking at the metrics of, all right, this month, where did I spend my time? Where did I spend my money? And you could code that by month, right? Like, wow, I spent a lot of money in um, in contractors. However, you know, I, I got to spend a lot more time with my family this month. Do I want to continue that? It could be. It could be a hell yeah. Or it could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends on how much you like your family. Um, but it, it is. It is saying, all right, this is where the money is going. Does that align with my goals? Now, if my contractor expense was really high and I spent a lot of time in the business, we need to evaluate why, right? So what went wrong? Why did I need to continue to spend so much time in the business while investing in, in other people um, who were supposed to be helping me? And it might, right, it might be uh, that they're still getting onboarded or, or um, we're not fully into the system yet. It'll, you know, we can reevaluate it again in 30 days. But by having this 30-day evaluation, right, you're not forgetting about it. You have a checkpoint to say, okay, that's still working. I want to continue to do that. I want to continue to invest my time, money, and energy there. Hmm. That's really wise too. Do you have a platform? You mentioned QuickBooks a few times. Is that a recommended tool for you? Do you have any other tools to recommend for managing all of this? Yeah, I love QuickBooks and Excel. So um, when we work with our clients, we put um, all, all their accounting records into QuickBooks. And then we pull all the information from QuickBooks into Excel documents. And then we use the Excel documents to... Um, to kind of pivot and, you know, you can't color code, you can't color code in QuickBooks for your emotions and energy. So we'll pull that into, into QuickBooks and then map it out for whatever the analysis might be with that client. Yeah. I use just a simple sheet in Google, Google sheet, and I can get so much done in there. You can do functions and sums. And like you mentioned, the color coding is so helpful for me. Um, so I feel like you can do a lot in there, but obviously QuickBooks is more catered to like numbers and getting those things on paper. Is there anything we've missed, Danielle? I feel like you've delivered a ton of information in just a few minutes here, but let me know if we've missed anything that you feel is really important to touch on. I think the biggest thing for, um, for bloggers to remember is that, um, it's okay to not feel really confident when it comes to your numbers or not really feel warm and fuzzy about what we talked about today. Right? Like money conversations can be difficult. They can bring up a lot of emotions. Um, you know, it's, it's a topic that isn't taught very well in school, if at all. And so most of us don't have this right skill set, right? We, we, we became a blogger and all of a sudden now we're supposed to have our have a <laughs> QuickBooks knowledge and understand how to read financial statements. So just give yourself a break, right? Like no shame. Um, I think that's the worst part for, for um, entrepreneurs is having the shame around like, why can't I figure this part of my business out? And I just want you to know you're not alone. It's not just you. Um, release the shame because if you're just shaming yourself into it, you're never going to get better. So look for help. Um, you're, you're not alone and, and don't, don't feel like you're just spinning your wheels. You can't ignore the numbers in your business. You have to look at them, right? Like you have, you have a responsibility to look at them. And so whatever you need to do to release the shame around that and get yourself the help that you need so that you'll look at those numbers, make sure you're doing that. I needed to hear this message a couple of years ago, Daniel, <laughs> because I was there. I was in a spot where I was ignoring my numbers. I thought it was okay. And I knew I was spending on the wrong things, a lot of money on the wrong things. Um, and I just, I don't know. I got to that point where I did feel like I just can't go there because I will be too ashamed. But once I started to dig in, oh my gosh, it so pays off just to know what's coming in and what's going out and being intentional and just like your message today, going in monthly and just making sure that you're doing, um, focusing on the right things every single month will put you so far ahead that you will be blown away. So I love that message. Thank you for all of this. Thank you for sharing everything you have and for being here today. We appreciate you so much. Of course. Happy to be here. I ask all my guests if they have either a favorite quote or words of inspiration. In addition to all the amazing stuff you've already shared, do you have something additionally to share with us? 
mind over matter. So if you ask my kids, uh, anybody around, uh, around me that knows me, I always believe in mind over matter. And so we can control our mind. And so if you can tell yourself, I can do this, right? Like I can look at my numbers this month, your mind is going to be able to control your actions. And so um, just remind yourself, like you have the power to control that narrative that you're telling yourself. So start working on your money mindset journey and, and get get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm, So many good messages today. We'll put together a show notes page for you, Danielle. So if anyone wants to go look at those, you can go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash kickstart accounting. So go look at those. And then Danielle, tell everyone where they can find you online and on social media. Yeah, come check out um, our website, kickstartaccountinginc.com. Um, if any of this resonated with you and you need help with your your bookkeeping or your analysis, um, anything like that, you could um, come book a call and do a strategy session with uh, a team member from Kickstart. Um, come hang out with us in, at Kickstart Accounting on Instagram. Um, the team are doing these really funny reels. And if you're like, no, Danielle, accounting is not funny. <laughs> I promise you, go check them out. They are doing such an amazing job. So it's uh, just kickstart accounting on on Instagram. Um, really funny. Okay. Now you've intrigued me after our call. I'm definitely going to look funny accounting. I have to see it. <laughs> <laughs> see it. They're doing so good. Oh, I love it. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Danielle, for being here. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. We're glad you could join us on this episode of Eat Blog Talk. For more resources based on today's discussion, as well as show notes and an opportunity to be on a future episode of the show, be sure to head to eatblogtalk.com. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll be here to feed you on Eat Blog Talk.